Excellent. There we go. Excellent. Okay, so let's jump in and get started. So as I said, uh, please get yourself over to the chat window if you haven't tried that yet. And you can drop in a note to say hello to let us know who you are. Um, and what uh, maybe what you're teaching or where you're coming from. And we'll ask everybody to uh, to keep your cameras off if you can, uh, to help with some of the bandwidth. Um, and there we go. That should be okay. I think we've only got, there we go. So keep your camera off if you can, just so that we don't get too many legs. Um, but this is an online presentation that we are doing with Aga Khan Museum. So this is Aga Khan Foundation Canada and Aga Khan Museum doing the session today. I'm gonna to pop over and share my screen to make sure that everybody can see that okay. There we go, excellent. So as I said, we will be recording this session uh, and you'll have a copy emailed to you uh, shortly after the session. So in case you wanted to review anything or um, take any other notes on things, you can go back to the session uh, afterwards. But you might also wanna consider leading your own PD session with your school or maybe even with your board. Given that you'll have all of these tools available, that everything will be available to you online, uh, you can show the video and have all of the materials. And you'll be able to do that as, as I said, if, there's, if you think there are other teachers within your board or within your school that might be interested, I would encourage you to try to run your own session. So my name is Catherine Boyce, and I'm the manager for education and youth engagement at Aga Khan Foundation Canada, or AKFC. And so for those of you who don't know who AKFC is, uh, we are an international development agency working in Africa and in Asia. And we're part of a larger global network of organizations, um, which is one of the world's largest private development networks. And it was founded by His Highness the Aga Khan, and it's called the Aga Khan Development Network. And that includes agencies like the Aga Khan Museum. AKFC's work in development is community led, it's gender sensitive, and it's long term. So we recognize that sustainable development means working on many fronts uh, all at the same time. So we work to strengthen community supports and civil societies. We work in strengthening infrastructure, improving food security and economic opportunities, uh, quality of and access to quality healthcare and education, um, and many other things. Uh, so uh, in here in Canada, though, we work with to help Canadians understand the importance of sustainable development and how that impacts all of us. So specifically with youth and educators, we create resources and learning opportunities like this, where Canadian educators can come together uh, to help gain the skills and the tools that they need to teach themes around sustainable development, around global citizenship, and around this idea of pluralism. We're pleased today to be joined by our colleagues from the Aga Khan Museum uh, for this super important topic uh, around exploring identity and inclusion, but through art. So what a very creative way to reach students and to explore what is sometimes uh, a more difficult area for teachers to explore or to find resources that they're comfortable using with their students. And there has been no better time uh, or important time than right now to have these conversations. So we will have, let me click through here to my presentation. So we will have two 30 minute presentations uh, followed by a 30 minute period for questions and discussion with the speakers. So again, I'll ask you to post your questions in the chat window uh, so that we can have the chat window going and we can, um, as I said, my colleague Salima from the museum and myself, uh, we will both be uh, monitoring the chat window so that we can uh, try to answer some of the immediate questions right there. And then we'll be pulling together the questions at the end for the moderated question time as well. Um, and so starting us off though, uh, you can see I've just left the bios up there for you to read them. I'll give you a quick beat here to take a second to read the, the bios of both of our very distinguished speakers that we have today. And so first of all, uh, Dr. Ulrike Alcamis is going to start us off by helping us discover the museum's digital collection and how we can use these objects to talk about and explain uh, many subjects through identity uh, and about inclusion, but also around this idea of pluralism. 
Uh, this is likely going to be a new term for many of you. And my hope for you, or my challenge for you, I guess, is that through this workshop and then over the summer, and as you're looking at resources and you're sort of mulling things over as you're getting ready to either come back with your students right now, as I said, particularly given the time that we're in right now, where a lot of these conversations are probably coming up with your class, your students, and I hope that they're coming up with your students and you're able to have conversations with them. But I want you to try to make this term a familiar term for you so that you can use this idea of pluralism and this concept of pluralism almost as a lens for your teaching. You know, uh, like many of you, I'm sure, many of you that are here for the session are already comfortable with doing cross-curricular work, right? That you don't feel that you're stuck in one box because that's the subject that you teach. We know with ideas like global citizenship uh, and some of these, you know, the sustainable development goals, that we're able to apply these more um, global competencies to many areas of our study. So I hope that you can find a space in your teaching to use this idea of pluralism for you and your students as a bit of a lens. So I'm not going to do any more talking. I am going to hand things over to Ilreke, who is going to explain this term a little bit more, more fully, but also give us some examples and walk us through the collection. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And Ilreke, if you would like, you can now share your screen and you can flip over with, your, with the presentation. And Salima, if you could put your presentation up for Ilreke. Oh, and you'll have to unmute that. Just, to, okay? just there you to go. say hello to everyone. I'm so pleased to be with you all today and with our team because it's um, what we are doing is urgent in the light of what's going on at the moment, but also really considering the fact that we do have deep, deep fault lines in our societies that through our various skills and professions, we have dedicated ourselves to addressing and to redress. So um, beyond the formal CV that you saw on the screen, just a little bit about myself as a person, because in many ways I live what I teach and what is involved in my work. I was born in Germany. I went to the United Kingdom to study, met my Iraqi husband, and after we finished our studies, we moved to Scotland. To Edinburgh and um, we started a family that now accounts to three as we call them German um, Scottish Iraqi children um, with three identities encapsulated in their individual selves and with two of them still living in Scotland today and one having gone to the Middle East to, to Dubai because she wanted to live her Arab identity above the other two identities. So um, being an in-betweener is part of my life, my family's life, and um, to me, a great um, asset. And uh, to my kids and my husband as well, we've always seen it as a positive thing, an exciting thing to, um, to learn from others and not only to recognize, but really to value human difference in all that we do. So today I wanted to tell you a little bit about the potential of objects to help you in your teaching. And I know that sometimes there's a little bit of hesitation to use um, museum objects because sometimes one doesn't feel one has enough knowledge and particularly when um, another culture is involved. And that's why I actually wanted to start with a very brief consideration of the object, any object. We, our lives are full of these objects. What is it with objects? Why do we have them? Why do we in fact collect them? Of course, on the one hand, there is definitely the immediate beauty and attraction of an object. This is one of my favorite tea mugs made in Italy. I bought it in Edinburgh in 2004 and it has traveled with me to the Gulf for 10 years and is now with me for um, cozy teas in the evening in Toronto. But beyond beauty and, and attraction, what is most important to us about our objects is actually the, what we associate with them. 
the memories they might encapsulate, the meanings they might have for us, and the multitude of sto stories that they tell about our lives, stories that we may or sometimes may not be happy to share with others. In fact, if you think about it, we all have museums in our own homes, full of objects we love, and more than that, objects that are reflections of ourselves. And in that respect, the objects of any museum collection and also our museum collection are in no way different. Again, they stand out as masterpieces of beauty and sophistication that um, they speak of those that were commissioned, created and used them. But their timeless significance actually lies in their ability to act as catalysts for conversations around themes that are actually timeless and go across time and space to this very day and can speak of the coming together of peoples and of cultures and also of multi-layered identities and above all the things that actually bind us all together. So today I would like to give you just three examples of how you might approach an object in the Aga Khan collection and as I always like to put it, take it places in terms of exploring the topics of the day in your classrooms. Salima, please, if you could put up the first slide for us. Can you see the first slide? No, not yet. Salima, are you putting up the first slide for us? And you can unmute if you need to, Salima, to talk to us. You're on mute still. Good. Technology certainly is one of the things that ties us all together in, in excitement and agony. Shall I try to share my screen? Sure. And what I'll do, Ilreki, while you're getting that up, I'm going to put the link to the collection. Is that is that helpful for everybody? Can I put that up in the chat window? Sure. In case people want to explore that later or... I will try to share my screen, so okay. please bear with me. There you go, we can see it now. Oh, it, it, is that my screen you can see, right? Yeah. Good, okay. That's great. So Excellent. let's think about material. So here we have an ivory horn that um, the scholars are still fighting over as to where it might have been made, either in Egypt or Southern Italy or Sicily in the 12th century. Now, Ivory in those days was a very coveted commodity that was traded along sub-Saharan trade routes from areas of today in Mali and Mauritania by Muslim and non-Muslim traders, Berbers and Arabs along the trade routes across the Sahara to the southern Mediterranean region of what is now Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Egypt. And from there, the ivory was carried by Italian merchants across the Mediterranean to southern Europe. But wherever this ivory went, it was considered a very luxurious commodity that was often decorated by local craftsmen. Now, we don't know exactly who these craftsmen were, but we know that around that time in Egypt, for one, the master carvers were Coptic Christians who had been carving both ivory and wood for centuries and continued to do so under Islamic rule. The imagery that they used was the imagery of royalty, hunting, leisure scenes, hunting animals, um, figures in, in combat with fantastic beings. 
And this was a visual language that at the time was shared by royalty across the religious divides. So rulers of both Islamic, oh sorry, um, Islamic and um, Muslim backgrounds spoke, as it were, metaphorically speaking, the same language and understood the symbolism and the references that were carved onto these ivory horns. Now, we don't know what happened to this piece after its creation in the 12th century for around 500 years. But then in the 1600s, it turns up in England. And it appears to have been given as a wedding gift to a young aristocratic couple, the husband of which was John Hare who in turn um, was a descendant of Richard the Lionheart who had been serving in the Crusades. So perhaps through the family, this horn came to Norfolk, um, to, to this particular household. Now on the occasion of the wedding, it appears that this ivory horn was decorated with the silver fittings that you see. And the details of the decoration that might have been added by um, a Jewish silversmith at the time, incorporate references to both the families. So the family of the hairs, which um, are shown in the silver fitting around the mouth of the piece, and then the, the cockerel's foot, which is an element that appears in the heraldic crest of the bride. At the same time, the function of the object also changed. Um, because in the original context of the southern Mediterranean, ivory horns like these were used as either musical instruments or um, ceremonial horns or hunting horns. But now in the new European English context, the function changed into a ceremonial drinking horn. Now again, several centuries take us to the 19th century, where we know that this piece was um, still in the possession of the same family and displayed in exhibitions in London at the Victoria and Albert Museum and in Manchester. And then at some point, again over 150 years later, it entered the collection of His Highness, who um, saw a direct affinity um, to this piece through his own cultural and historic connections to Egypt at that time. So he saw the piece as something closely related to his and his family's identity. So when you think about the story I just told you, and the many things, the many people, the many impacts that have made this object what it is today, and the, the journey that it has taken across continents over centuries, is it not the perfect metaphor for a multi-layered identity, and particularly that of a migrant having had to cross continents? The second theme you can use to approach an object is the decoration. Here we have a plate from 16th century Ottoman Turkey from a town called Iznik. And this type of ware was initially very much influenced by Chinese ceramics, but then came to reflect the local taste and obsession with horticulture, and particularly with the tulip. Now, the tulip, of course, originates in Central Asia, but by the 12th century had reached Iran and Iraq, and already by that time was not, not only celebrated for its beauty and sophistication, but because of its mystical associations, particularly because in Persian and in Turkish, the name for tulip is lale, 
which has the same letters that in Arabic spell out the word for God. The tulip became a major obsession in the Ottoman Empire, which ruled much of Turkey, the Balkans, and the, the Near East and North Africa from the 15th to the early 20th century. And um, the interest was indeed both horticultural and spiritual. So much effort went into celebrating the tulip uh, through breeding and through um, looking at flower arrangements and writing poetry about the tulip and holding festivals. It was a major cultural obsession of um, the people at the time. Meanwhile, in the 16th century, the first tulip bulbs were brought to Europe by the ambassador of the Austrian Emperor Ferdinand I, and they reached the Netherlands. And here, they soon became um, a craze just as they had been and continued to be in the Ottoman Empire. And we know that in the 17th century, an Amsterdam mansion uh, had the same price as one very rare tulip bulb. And in fact, the speculation around tulip bulbs went so crazy that uh, several merchants uh, went bankrupt over uh, tulip trading. Ironically, by that time, the Netherlands had started supplying the Ottoman Empire with their own exotic variants of the tulip in order to feed their annual tulip festivals. Ever since then, really, the tulip in, in popular knowledge has become associated with the Netherlands. But originally, of course, it came from far, far further east. And of course, for us here in Canada, the story doesn't even stop there. Because in the uh, war days, in the 1940s, the Dutch princess Juliana and her two daughters were evacuated to Ottawa. And in fact, um, she gave birth to her third daughter, Marguerite, in Ottawa um, at the main hospital. So in gratitude for having been granted sanctuary and the safe delivery of her daughter, the, the uh, princess, which later became, of course, queen of the Netherlands, um, gave Canada 10,000 tulip bulbs annually in recognition of uh, Canada's stance. And that tradition, of course, has continued to this very day. And if you hopefully can come back to the museum very soon, you might still see the remnants of the tulips that we ourselves, in connection with the Dutch consulate, plant every year in recognition of this friendship. So again, a wonderful uh, departure point to talk about uh, interconnectedness and interwoven uh, traditions. Finally, the third approach is content or a theme. Here I'm showing you a manuscript of the Masnavi by Jalaluddin Rumi, which was calligraphed and illustrated in Isfahan in Iran in 1603. Of course, the original work was written in the 13th century, so 400 years early, and it was written by Rumi in the Turkish city of Konya in Anatolia, in Persian, because originally Rumi came from an area that is today contested between Afghanistan and uh, Tajikistan. And his family, in the wake of the Mongol invasions in the early 13th century, had to leave. They were uh, uprooted and they had to run away westwards. And their refugee story took them from the area they came from to Baghdad in Iraq, to what is now Saudi Arabia, to Damascus in Syria, and eventually to Konya. And it was in Konya that Rumi, the refugee, the migrant, the newcomer, 
the in-betweener, wrote his work of poetry, um, which became so popular all over not only the Islamic world, but even around the world, that it was translated into many different languages and in fact is today the most popular foreign poetry in translation in North America. So this particular piece gives me a wonderful opportunity to pass over to Marianne to talk a little bit more about how in between us with multi-layered identities continue to create artworks that inspire all of us um, today and that perfectly link historical and cultural traditions with individual artistic expressions in our 21st century globalized world. So over to you, Marianne. Hello everyone, it's so wonderful to be here today. I thought I'll show you my face, that I'm a real person and not, not just a speaking voice before I head in. Um, and uh, while I just uh, say hi, um, I am going to uh, share my screen with you um, so that we can start uh, my presentation. Extra points, Ilreki, for perfect timing on your presentation and excellent transition, Marianne, into your technology. High fives for virtual presentation points. <laughs> and now the, the problem comes to actually switch my camera off. But anyway, um, I may have to just leave myself there. I, think I can do that for you. I can do that for you. Don't worry. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for welcoming he me here today. I'm really excited about speaking about the exhibition that's currently in the museum and that will still be there when the museum, hopefully when the museum opens again um, soon. Uh, and it's called Don't Ask Me Where I'm From. But before I do, do so, I thought I'd introduce myself a little bit like Ulrika has. Um, I am, you know, we all, we often do this. We talk about ourselves in terms of where we come from. Uh, so. Uh, you know, so easily we can be determined, our identity becomes this thing that is simply based on our, our birth. And I was born in South Africa. Um, I then moved to the UK. I studied there, I moved to the UK. I worked there for seven years actually as a teacher. Um, and after that, uh, moved to Canada. I had my first daughter in, um, in London, in the UK, and my second daughter was born here in Canada. So uh, I myself am an immigrant uh, with multiple different kind of touch points and different continents. And my children uh, were born in different places and also share some of my identity and some of their own identity. But of course, I'm, you know, I'm more than that. I'm also on a far more mundane level. Uh, I'm a mother, a sister, a daughter, a wife, an artist, um, so many different things. And uh, that makes up our identity. It's not just simply where we're born um, and sort of our ethnic backgrounds, uh, but certainly this plays and plays into who we are. And today, of course, we are going to focus on that. But I know that there are a lot of children who might not be able to relate directly with having been born elsewhere. And I think it's really valuable to note that we are all complex human beings. We are all made up of multiple different facets, um, much like a diamond. And our racial identity or our ethnic identity is simply uh, you know, one portion of it, albeit um, a substantial portion. Um, I really love this quote by Stuart Hall. Uh, he is uh, one of my favorite writers. Uh, he says, identity is not as transparent or unproblematic as we think. Perhaps instead of thinking of identity as an already accomplished historical fact, um, I should think instead of identity as a production, or we should think of identity in, uh, instead as a production, which is never complete, always in process. And many of the artists that we'll be discussing today uh, look at their identities as a sort of a production, something that's an ongoing process um, based on where they find themselves in, in, the, in the world and in their lives in particular, um, as they sit between various cultures and navigate that. So something I came across uh, recently, I found very interesting. Uh, it's a, I'm going to quote something. The number one predictor of your success in today's borderless world is not your IQ, IQ, 
not your resume or your CV, and not even your expertise, writes social scientist David Livermore in his book, The Cultural Intelligence Difference. It's your CQ. I'm sure you've all heard about IQ <laughs> as educators and the often spoken about EQ, but um, I don't know if you've heard about CQ necessarily. Certainly, I hadn't until recently. And CQ is your cultural intelligence. It is that learned or implicitly understood skill of recognizing that cultural difference, differences lead to different ways of thinking and acting and responding in ways that are appropriate to those cultural differences. Someone with a low CQ might have a tendency to view everyone else's behavior through his own cultural lens, which could potentially lead to misunderstandings and communication gaps, despite speaking the same language. I believe that artists in this exhibition give us a glimpse of what it is to have CQ and can help us acquire the tools we need to build our own CQ if we listen to their stories and learn from their experiences. Don't Ask Me Where I'm From presents the experiences of artists who are part of a growing global population of people who are raised in a culture other than that of their parents. So we're talking about what, what we call here second generation immigrants. Uh, so people who were born say in Canada, but their parents were from elsewhere. Um, some of them may have come when they were really young, but the culture that they're very comfortable with is a Canadian culture in our context. Um, even though they have these links to other cultures that through language, through um, foods, through other cultural experiences, and possibly by visiting um, other countries where their parents are from. So they have these sort of rich and layered cultural uh, identities. Um, the title comes from the artist's lived experiences. So don't ask me where I'm from, really is because it's actually quite difficult to unpick where you're from if you have these multiple layers of experience. Um, and even for myself, as someone who is far more of a new immigrant, when someone asks me where I'm from, I have to think carefully, am I from Toronto or am I from South Africa? Or, you know, where do, where do, I, where do I want to position myself? And it, it becomes complicated. So they, but their hybrid experience um, gives them something that I think is very valuable. It in fact makes them sort of mediators or bridges between different cultures because they have insights into different cultures. Their hybrid experience allows them to see the world from multiple perspectives and lets them navigate it as both insiders and outsiders, often at the same time. I believe this gives them a unique critical ability and a deep and enduring empathy for other ways of looking at the world. This is just a little view of the exhibition that's installed at the museum. And some of the works, um, a lot of these I won't have a chance to talk about, but I will be picking out just a few of them very shortly. One of the artists that I won't talk about her work specifically, but I really liked her, um, what she said. She said, growing up bicultural means always feeling a little bit out of place, always understanding that you are also the other. Growing up, I remember wishing I could just be one thing, which really in our times is impossible. What does it even mean to be just one thing? Now I appreciate the perspective. So no, I don't have Frida Kahlo in the exhibition much as I'd love to, but I thought this would be a nice little starting point just to point out that we are, um, we are really the product, not just of our culture, but also of our parents and their cultures um, and the kind of multi-layered uh, influences that we have through that, which leads me on to our first artist called, uh, her name's Tenjiwen Niking Kosi. She was born in America, but her um, parents are South African and she now lives back in South Africa again. And she uh, created a video for this exhibition called The Beginning of Stories. Now, The Beginning of Stories really is um, about her story. And the reason she did this was she realized that having grown up in America, but having these um, stories told by her parents about home, which in fact for her parents is South Africa, put her in this in-between space where she didn't really know where home was. Um, and when she had her first child, she realized that, te that 
the stories we tell our children are really impactful in giving them a sense of identity and a sense of belonging. So she went through this process of creating this video. This is a still, and here's another still of the video, uh, where she unpacks her own family history and sort of explores it. And in exploring her own family history, she talks about stories in a much, much broader sense. Um, and this work in particular has its sort of uh, its starting point from a Zulu myth that says that all stories come from the sea. And something I really like about this, I mean, I like a lot of things about it, but one of the things is that there is this notion of having a repository in the ocean. We all have stories, we all draw on stories, we all draw on similar stories to sort of inform our identity. So short stories shape us. Cultural stories, fairy tales, family stories, stories about history, these all give us a sense of who we are and provide us with the sense of context and a sense of identity. And she points to the importance of choosing those stories, thinking about those stories and telling those stories um, to help us to just uh, create a, a better sense of who we are. Um, I think for, for, for teachers, um, it's always, a starting point is actually just thinking back through family trees in Canada. Uh, I think it would be hard pressed to find someone who can't trace their family back to somewhere else, even if it's, you know, great grandparents or, or beyond. But we're all from somewhere. We all have a, a layered, multi layered, multicultural history um, in our backgrounds. The next artist that I want to talk about is John Young Zerungi, and he also talks about stories, but rather than very, very personal stories, he does something else. He actually looks into the archive. He does a bit of historical digging um, uh, because he's also interested in the power and the potency of stories and how stories that are told in one particular way or through one particular perspective uh, can become really problematic if they, uh, if they exclude other voices. His work is called Lambing Flat, and um, it deals with, uh, with uh, a Chinese migrants in Australia. As a Chinese migrant himself who lives in Australia, he was very interested in his own history or the sort of the, um, the history of these people within Australia. Uh, he was born in Hong Kong and he moved to Australia in 1967. This work is called Lambing Flat, and it deals with the largest civil riots in Australia's history, which was the uprisings um, of 1860 and 1861 in the New South Wales goldfields of Barragong. These 10 months of unrest were the result of rising racial tensions and anti-Chinese sentiment over gold mining practices and cultural misunderstandings, during which Chinese miners were subjected to threats, scalping, and other sustained acts of violence. 1,200 Chinese miners were eventually sheltered, clothed, and fed by local grazier James Roberts, who invited them to camp on his property in the months following 1861. What I like about this is, um, anyway, I'll come back to this. I'll finish the story first. One consequence of the Lambing Flats riots was the eventual development of the white Australia policy in 1901. So that's almost what 40 years later. A set of exclusionary immigration policies that remained in force until 1973. So the work is a potent reminder of the dangers inherent in writing history from a single selective perspective. Um, what, what John Young does here is he sort of explodes that single perspective and he says, okay, there was that perspective, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to include other perspectives in this. I'm going to go back into history and find out what the Chinese perspective was on this. Um, but not only that, uh, and I think very cleverly, he doesn't polarize it between, you know, the Chinese and the sort of the so-called white Australians, but he includes voices that aren't even mentioned in this. He talks about, you look at the, um, on the right-hand side, there's a, a close-up of the panel, the where a jury exists. So where a jury were um, an Aboriginal group who actually owned that land, who lived on that land for, you know, generations and generations and centuries and centuries before this, these riots came about, uh, about the land that they probably didn't even own. 
so he includes voices that were stilled and silenced in his um, in his history. He adds a third layer to the story, and then he adds a fourth layer, um, and that's the story of James Roberts, who is the grazier, just innocently living on his land, who then notices this incredibly violent acts and steps in, um, and he includes acts of kindness in his history and i think this is a wonderful potent reminder that we cannot ignore acts of kindness that exist uh, in these moments because we are more than just the acts of violence and the polarization we are also about acts of kindness um, and that becomes part of the story and uh, and i i think that this is a really it's a really positive story um, the other point is just the negativity of something that's that only shows one perspective is shown very clearly here, where it becomes this long tale of consequences from one poorly told story, um, from one particular perspective that then has negative consequences that flow on through time um, and with almost unpredictable consequences moving forward. So it's a, um, it's a really good reminder, especially in our times, uh, that we need to be very careful and mindful of the stories we tell and to tell multiple stories and not to limit our storytelling to one perspective, whichever perspective that might be. Um, and I think that really counts to inclusiveness uh, in, in, in many ways. Um, the next, this is also an artist, of course, I'd love to have an exhibition. Uh, her name is Zineb Zadira. Um, and I have her here because she did a recent work, she uh, has work in the Take Modern and so on, she's not in the exhibition, um, about language. And I think language is a big, a, a big issue, it's a big deal. Our identity is so closely tied with our language or the languages we speak. And our experience of a culture comes down to language. What she does here is on the left hand side, it's um, uh, Zineb with her mother. Her mother is Algerian and speaks Arabic. Uh, she speaks French to her mother, but they're able to communicate in the middle. She's speaking French to her daughter who speaks English and they're able to communicate. On the right, the daughter speaks English to the grandmother who speaks Arabic and they're unable to communicate. Um, an artist in this exhibition also tackle issues of language and identity. Um, particularly, I'm going to draw out Sarah Maple. Sarah Maple is uh, a British artist, but her mother is from the Punjab, and um, her work is called Learn Punjabi in 30 Easy Steps. And that's how it work, looks. It looks like a very kind of a simple Punjabi lesson, and what she's done is she has taken the format of a kind of a teach yourself uh, language lesson and she's made it incredibly personal. Much of Sarah Maple's work focuses on her hybrid upbringing. Her mother, as I said, came from the Punjab and her family moved to the UK after partition in 1947. Her mother's side of the family speaks Punjabi and though Maple grew up with a language, she never learned to speak it herself. Her grandmother, in turn, never learned English. And while the two were very close, they barely spoke a word to each other. Sarah describes having felt throughout her life shame at her inability to speak Punjabi and at her perceived inability to connect with a wider Muslim community. She'd go to family gatherings or functions and hide for fear of someone speaking to her. As a child, she rented Punjabi tapes from the library and would listen to them in secret late at night but she felt that her lack of Punjabi separated her from her own cultural identity. Now she has renewed her efforts to learn the language and has started taking classes and practicing speaking. Taking these classes opened her eyes to the fact that her experience was far from unique. Many of the others in her class were also attempting to reconnect with their heritage through language. This realization led her to think more about how second generation immigrants in the UK connect with their culture through language or fail to do so. Language um, for us should be an easy in with kids. Um, I know there are kids who only speak one language, but certainly I would imagine that in certain parts of the country, uh, speaking English and French wouldn't be odd. I grew up speaking 
um, Afrikaans and English. And I know from my own experience that my experience of a culture or experience of a culture shifts if you're able to speak the language. Uh, you get a different view on that culture uh, if, you're, if you can speak it. Um, and I think that this is another way that as educators, we can maybe draw attention to the value of language and the importance of language in communicating our identity and also in determining how we see the world, um, how, we, how we see other cultures. Uh, it can be, we can be biased without knowing our own bias simply because we're only, we only have one perspective on something. This work, what she does here is, if you look very closely on the right, she does very ordinary things like, how are you? Um, or I need a receipt, but she intersperses it with very, very personal things like, I am ashamed, or I wish I'd learned Punjabi when you were alive. So speaking directly to her grandmother. So this is in fact the, the language lesson that she would have loved to have in order to be able to speak to her grandmother. The next artist that I'll very quickly look at is Elena Al-Asmar and she comes back to this whole notion of identity and how identity is formed. Her work Arioso Operosa, Arioso means airy, Operosa means industrial and the title reflects on the traditional craft of embroidery, um, you'll see why in a minute, and the mechanical efficiency of a photocopier. And this is her work. These are photocopied sheets of paper she took an heirloom, a family heirloom, a piece of um, lace that she then subjected to the photocopier. She photocopied them over and over and over, creating this wonderful textured pattern. Um, but in doing so, if any one of you have, and I'm sure many of you have, the more you photocopy the same thing, the more distorted it gets. The light sort of bits disappear, the dark bits become darker, and actually it, it doesn't become a carbon copy of the previous one. It actually shifts and changes. And she uses this as a metaphor for identity, how identity shifts and changes over time. It's not something like Stuart Hall also says, it's not something that's set in time and stable. It actually morphs and shifts and changes. Um, much like stories that are told and retold uh, shift and change, much how cultures over time very, very slowly shift and change. Things aren't set in stone and we so often think that something is, um, is set and yet we, because the motion is so slow, we don't notice it and she's drawing attention to that in her work. The next artist that I wanna draw attention to, which also ties back to identity is Maria Nemchenko. She's a Lithuanian Russian artist who lives in the UK and she created a work called No More Than Vodka and Kebabs. And this is the work. It's a photograph, a family photograph. And if you look carefully, you'll see that it's her mother that's holding her as a baby. Now we can't see her at all and we can't see her mother's face. We do see a carpet in the background. And when I showed this work um, to someone who came to visit the exhibition who was uh, sort of uh, with a Russian background, she immediately recognized carpets hanging on the wall as a sort of a cultural symbol. This is what, you know, her family all have carpets hanging on the wall. Um, and carpets for the museum also have all kinds of other meanings, of course. But um, what she's done here is she's created a secondary carpet. She's created a carpet uh, like a mandala that covers over the faces of her and her mother. And if you look very closely to that, you'll notice that it's made up of stickers of vodka bottles, kebabs, pickles, all kinds of things that you would have, you would think of as sort of stereotyped um, Russian, uh, Russian things. Um, and she's saying something very simple. She's saying that very often stereotypes get superimposed over actual identity. Um, people aren't able to be who they are because they are stereotyped to such an extent that their identity, their real identity is obliterated. Which draws me to the next artist that also talks about the same kind of thing, but from a different perspective. And I think um, I always like to end with her because there's something very empowering about it. Liberty Batson, she created a work which is called The Power of Perception. And it's a game. Uh, it's, a, it's a game that's influenced 
by kind of late modernism and the instructional works of Sol de Witt. So Sol de Witt did these, what he called instruction-based projects where he hired individuals to construct installations based only on his instructions. So he'd give the instructions and someone else would create the work. And of course, they never really looked the same. Um, and so she gives us instructions for her game. And here is her game. You'll see they're created of these pyramids. Um, and she invites people to play the game by moving the pyramids, to use the instructions and move the pyramids around. Um, but what actually happens is she draws attention to the fact that each individual will create a completely different color pattern based on their choices and their decisions at that moment. And there is an almost infinitesimal number of variations that are available. I think she worked it out and like, I can't even remember the number. It, it's, a, it's like nano somethings. Um, anyway, the, the point here is that we all make choices as individuals. We may have a strong cultural, linguistic, uh, other, uh, other things that tie into our identity, but ultimately, we decide what we do and how we move. We, we have agency over our choices and we all have choices in how we act, how we react, um, and how we make that construct our identity. So um, I think it's a super empowering work just because it reminds us that we're not just necessarily, we don't have to be subject to everything else and the stereotypes that get applied to us. We can take control over who we are. I'll quickly look at El Cid because uh, we all love El Cid and also because I think his quote reminds us again of this whole thing of when you are an immigrant um, or when you are a second generation person and you sit between various cultures, how, uh, how it can be really difficult sometimes and you have this sense that you have to move to either one side or the other side because being a bridge, being in the middle is sometimes really uncomfortable. Um, and as he says here, he sort of decided at one point to move more towards his Tunisian identity. And then he finishes by saying, I think it was a mistake to think that I had to make a choice, but I only discovered that later on. So he embraces both his French side and his Tunisian side and, and the uniqueness that comes from that. Uh, he created this work called Chenou Laba, and it is Arabic text. He uses text much like music in the sense that anyone can appreciate what it looks like without having to necessarily be able, able to unpick it. Uh, it's also interactive and it really invites viewers to move these little panels around um, much like one's identity will shift and change in different ways over time. Um, it's, it's a process and it's not set in stone. Uh, the quote that he's got on it is from Stendhal and it says, love is the miracle of civilization. Um, and as I finish, one of my favorite quotes by one of the artists, the migrant feels eternally foreigner and native, but at the same time, this condition develops empathy, open-mindedness and strength. And I think that as educators, if we can encourage empathy, open-mindedness and strength, in those that come across our path, then really most of our work is done. Um, and I also want to say that I think that the complexity of living in, in two worlds at the same time and simultaneously is challenging, but if one can overcome that and recognize that in some way we all live in multiple different worlds at the same time, and we all have to sit within that uncomfortable space and unpick it, uh, Certainly, if we think about it long enough, we'll be able to recognize some of those, those uncomfortable points. Uh, we will be better for it. Because it's, it's not an easy position to be in, but I think it gives us a way of looking at the world that's far more generous and empathetic. And I would argue that it gives us a CQ. It shows us that there are multiple ways of looking at things. Um, and uh, sometimes different is just different. It's not wrong, it's just, just different. So with that in mind, um, I want to finish and uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to the questions. Excellent, thank you, Mary Ann. Thank you, Mary Ann and Ulrike. 
Um, so I'm going to ask everybody to uh, pop their questions in in the chat window here so that we can have a bit of a discussion. And one of the things that I really want us to consider is that whenever we do these sessions, particularly when we do them in person, we always make sure that tables can kind of get together and can share, have some time to share how they can see this in their own practice. Maybe either you're already doing something similar and you want to share it with others or, you know, what really sparked with you as you were watching it and thought, oh my gosh, I've been having this conversation and this is exactly what I would love to bring to my class and to my students. Um, so pop some ideas over there in the chat window because I'd love to have that discussion. And um, But some of the things, you know, I think there were some really great things that came up there. This idea, you know, there was a lot of positive comments on this idea of your CQ, you know, and that it's just this idea about exposure as well and understanding. And I think when we asked everybody to register, we talked about, you know, we asked you to share with us what it is that you, you know, in looking at this session, what are you struggling with with your students and with your classroom? And there was a real mix of things that came up. Uh, a lot of you have classrooms that are, you know, that are very, I guess we say now sort of globalized, right? You have a lot of students that are fitting into the categories of some of these artists from the exhibit that are identifying with multiple identities, multiple cultures, this fluency, as Marianne talks about it, this fluency in many um, cultures, not just languages, but also the power of language. Um, so I would love to ask um, maybe if anybody has, uh, oh, I sorry, I've also posted before we move on, I've posted the link for the 3D tour as well so that you can see the objects up close. It's something that you'll be able to share with your students, particularly in this time where we're working virtually. You know, you can create all sorts of discussions and conversations with them where they can be exploring on their own time. And I think there's some power to the students being able to explore that in their own way and explore it in their own time, particularly if they're unpacking some of these questions or these issues or vice versa for students that have never thought about some of these different cultures or perspectives, I think it's a really nice way for them to, to unpack some of this. And same goes for the collection. You know, there could be objects in the collection that you might want to send through as an activity, and the students can have that time for reflection and looking at them and, you know, making those connections or answering the discussion questions. Um, so maybe I'm just gonna look over here for a second to see in the chat window if anybody's got anything. Um, oh, yes, and Salima's mentioned the virtual tours are also going to be available. And if you want the curator to come and do a presentation to your classes, that they're happy to look at that option. I think particularly now with virtual sessions, I think now is the time to try that out. I think there's a receptiveness to that. And I think you can have a great conversation with a curator about one of the collections in the virtual tours. I know we've done that with um, other schools and academies throughout the world. Uh, so I think that would be a great opportunity. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to just jump in with a virtual tour. Yes, um, please do. I had an opportunity touring you through the virtual tour, but I think uh, because we only wanted to focus in on a few things, please do visit it. I'm sure that Salima will share it with everyone because embedded in the virtual tour is in fact the videos that I spoke about too. So Tenjiwe's video is available to view through the virtual tour. There are short interviews with artists that are also embedded in the virtual tour. Um, and there's another artist, Pimo Halim, who also has videos. And all of that is, um, is viewable uh, when you access the virtual tour. So uh, by all means, look at that. But I thought for, the, for our discussion, it was just easier to, to do a PowerPoint. Yeah, absolutely. It'll crash on us. Um, and just quickly, too, there's a question here. I know some teachers, um, I'm sorry that we were only able to do this presentation in English today. Um, but we are looking to see if we can offer it in French. Uh, but we do have um, uh, we do have resources, some resources that are available in French, particularly all of AKFC's resources are in French. And so if that's something that you need help with, please don't hesitate to contact uh, to contact us. You can contact me or you can contact the museum, but we'll definitely be able to help you with that. Alors, s'il y a des questions en français ou des ressources en français, on pourra toujours envoyer um, quelques-unes en français, surtout avec la Fondation. Um, toutes nos ressources sont en français et en anglais. Uh, ce qui est pratique aussi avec immersion. So uh, AKFC's resources are also in French and English, which is also really helpful if you're teaching an immersion or um, any kind of immersion classes. So, um, Ulrike, maybe can I pass it over to you to get started a little bit on a discussion? Is there something that you wanted to add or get us started with? Yes, <clears throat> I just wanted to um, say that our effort today was really to open up your 
your minds and show you the possibilities of how to look at art in general and then also make the connections to um, everyone's individual lives. So rather than looking for the facts um, that come with the objects and the specific information that is often added to the objects uh, from curatorial um, experts, our approach is really that um, the objects belong to everyone and you and your students should look at them and have your own associations with them and feel confident to look for the stories and the connections that you want to make with these objects, whether they are historical objects or contemporary departures. And then also look at the approaches that were taken and the, the confluence of the many, many influences that come to play to um, open the floor to the students themselves and empower them around a topic of, of universal interest and concern. We always feel that um, when, when we hand over to the students and actually allow them creatively to express themselves on their own terms, um, amazing, amazing things happen. And um, I, I hope that we've given you some taster of, of, of the many different ways in which this is possible in the museum, but of course now also in our current reality um, online with the virtual resources that we have available and that we are adding to all the time. I really like that idea, Ulrike, of, you know, allowing the students to dig around in the collection, you know, and to really find how they choose to find something that identifies them, right? I think that's I think that's insult, insightful for us as educators as well. I think too, it was um, Anne had mentioned earlier in the presentation about that idea of the you know the line of visibility, right? And what what we might make assumptions about by you know meeting our students very briefly or just getting to know them, you know, and all the things that we don't know about them right, about those identities mm -hmm. that they might not feel comfortable expressing or, you know, it just doesn't come up or we don't have the time to interact with them to uncover that or we haven't taken the time. Um, I think allowing them to choose an object like this really, I th hopefully, is helpful for them, but also, uh, you know, hopefully as educators to help us shape how we are presenting things. And even this idea of, um, you know, students finding, finding themselves represented in the content of your classroom. Right. Yes. And resources. Yeah. You know, we we talk about having books with, you know, particularly with younger children, having books and being represented. But I think this is so much, so much deeper. Right. Being represented in the classroom. Absolutely. And it is very liberating both for the teachers and for the students to just open the floor and say, OK, go and have a look. Which object do you love? And come back and tell us why. And I had an amazing experiment with that. Uh, approach uh, not so very long ago when I had a group of experts, museum professionals and curators in uh, our bell reef room, which is a very cozy salon that has uh, glass cases, traditional beautiful glass cases with Islamic ceramics. And I sat them all down and I said, okay, I would like you to forget everything you've ever learned and I want you to take off your scientific and your scholarly hat. And I just want you to look around and each one of you choose an object that you love and tell me why. And it was amazing. The first lady that dared to speak up because of course, you know, how can I just say something emotional be, be, without bringing the intellectual knowledge to the table? She pointed at um, um, a luster object, a metallic gold sheeny object in the case, and she said, you know, this object reminds me so much of my granny because she had a similar object in her glass case at home. And I loved it when I used to go to my granny. And those were the best times in my life because I always felt cozy and warm in her place and I miss her so much. Mm. And then another um, gentleman, who is an archaeologist, he looked at it and he said, I noticed that all the objects or most of the objects in this case has no handles. They are all round. And 
there's only two objects that have a handle and I would really, really love to put my hand into this handle and lift the object to see how it feels. So um, it was amazing the associations that people made. And then of course, on the basis of that, you can start then building uh, a story, whether it is, um, as I said, you know, through through the, mat the material, the shape, the, de the decoration, or um, the theme that it might represent. Where if you if you have a look through our online collections, and of course also through what Marianne has presented, you can find themes that are absolutely universal. You know, the search to belong, love, conflict, um, our humanity's engagement with nature, um, how literature has played such an important part in our lives, even when it has come from other parts of the world entirely, poetry that continues to inspire us. How do you visualize poetry in a way that reflects the essence of the world in visual form? So what I, what I love about this approach is that whatever your particular subject matter might be, it, it could even be maths, there's plenty of objects that you can analyze and examine on the basis simply of mathematical and geometrical principles. So it's just a mindset of being confident to look at what is available, what we have, and then let something draw you and open the door for the conversation. Absolutely, I really like that idea. I like you've put it on on its head for me too. thinking about adults. Wouldn't this be great if we could do this activity for our next staff meeting, right? With all the teachers in your school, especially now when we're not seeing each other live, right? If you could ask all of the teachers at your school, your colleagues to dig around and find their own object and make a slide explaining why they chose it, how interesting that would affect our working relationship with our fellow teachers, right? The teachers in your own classroom, especially if you're, you know, you're sharing with other teachers, you know, how neat that would be, how that changes our perspective and how we work with each other, right? And how maybe we lean on each other for different parts of our teaching. Yeah, it'd be a great team builder, as Anne's saying there. Um, and so I'm just going to read out here. So I, 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 Christine is saying she, she has a unit where they focus on the idea of representing, uh, of representing, so speaking with your own voice and using your own experience. Yeah, this absolutely would be perfect for that. I think sometimes it's nice to just have new resources, you know, to think about it in a different way, right? You know, we might have other uh, materials we're using for those topics, like Christine's mentioned. Uh, but yeah, she said these would be a really great example for talking about those themes. And then Brenda here saying, I have a unit where I ask my students to create a work of art on their identity, looking at their relationships and experiences. So this exhibit would be a great place uh, to have them explore how others have tackled this idea. Strengthening yeah. the relationship amongst other teachers. Marianne, do you want to pop in and maybe comment on some of this? Um, yes, just briefly. I think um, what one of the things that really makes me excited about the exhibition uh, is just, and I didn't even go into the background of how the exhibition was put together, but it, it was fairly restrictive uh, in terms of what we told the artists they could do. They had to create it for particular for panels, as you could see in the, the one image I showed. Um, but just the kind of creativity that they showed, even given those limitations. Um, and I think as, as someone who was an art teacher and who is an artist, uh, I am excited no end by the range of things that I think one can use to, um, to initiate not only conversations, but actually creative practices. So everything from, you know, making a game, creating a game, which of course can also translate into something that's maybe mathematical too. Um, thinking about language as, you know, Sarah Maple did her language lesson and maybe thinking about French language lessons for those that can't speak French and the kind of things that are actually useful phrases to incorporate in that rather than the sort of the stock phrases that we usually see. So thinking creatively about how we can be inclusive uh, even in something like a lesson. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and getting the kids to think about it rather than the teachers sort of, uh, you know, starting from a teaching perspective. Uh, and then, of course, 
even something as simple as making photocopies um, and uh, and how that can have um, meaning beyond that. Um, so to me, it's just a kind of a, a wonderful creative uh, bucket that one can choose from and pick from. Uh, yeah. The other thing that I want to just speak uh, very quickly about just going back about how important it is for people to see themselves represented uh, in artworks. Um, I think, well, one of the one, a, a lot of the feedback that I've received from this exhibition so far has been people saying, wow, I thought it was only me who felt like that. Um, I thought it was only me who had this experience around language and worrying about losing my language and therefore losing my identity in the process. Um, I didn't know other people felt the same. So the power of speaking out and the power of actually being visible and saying what some of those challenges are empowers other people and includes other people and enables them to then say their thing. So I think the, the starting point of how brave it is for these artists to actually speak out and in so doing creating the community and pro, uh, through the process um, they have created a kind of a global community. They're from all over the show. They have different experiences really on a day-to-day -day basis, but somehow some of those core issues persist and they're the same. So we're not so different after all from other people. <laughs> we are all, yeah. we are all the same in so many ways. Our differences really are, are just the sort of the sparkles around the edges that make us unique. And I think the, the impact on mental health there, right, that you spoke about, right, is that, you know, that empowerment for students. And I think, you know, we talked a lot before the session about some of the some of the different themes. But, you know, that idea that, you know, there could be some students, as you said, that have maybe never been given. They might not feel like they've ever been sort of given permission to have a dual identity. Right. You know, they might have felt this pressure to, you know, to conform with one or the other right? That that concept is maybe not even something that's ever been discussed. And, you know, I think we can all look at what can we do in creating an inclusive environment in our classroom with our students to help make sure that, you know, that that idea is possible, right? I mean, we talk about that. Here we are. It's Pride Month. It's Pride Month in the schools. It's National Indigenous History Month. It's, you know, I mean, there's so many opportunities for us to be talking about identity and expression of freedom of expression of identity for our students. Right. And about how how that can be so, so deterring to them. Right. And their success in their classrooms. Right. If they're not seeing themselves reflected in the materials that are being taught, you know, are we surprised that some are tuning out? Right. I mean, yeah, I really like that point, Marianne, of sort of how liberating and empowering an exhibit like this, particularly being used in the classroom, can be for students. And I think yeah. this and I point think of sharing uh, universality, sorry, um, is really, really important because what Marianne uh, just said there is so very true. Um, we all who have moved around the world and are intermarried with other cultures have kids who are living and working all over the world. Um, we share many, many experiences. And while the specifics might be different, but um, there are many universal aspects to explore. And um, I think it's very important to, to unlock those. And if we look at students in, in their diversity as a pool of amazing resource and skill and creativity and honor, what they are able to bring to the table if only we unlock their potential and empower them to do it on their own terms because sometimes especially in a school environment of course you know the, the system itself sometimes uh, imposes a certain degree of rigidity and conformity on what both teachers and students are expected to deliver but if there is a way to navigate it in an inclusive way that honors what everyone has to bring to the table around the universal topic of interest and concern to everyone, really, really amazing things can come out. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really well put. Um, 
I'm going to give a hold a beat here just in case anybody else has any other questions that they would like to pose um, either, you know, to the group in general for a discussion or specifically um, for either of our presenters here. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to do do my thing, which is, of course, to um, put up the link in the chat window here for the um, feedback form, an evaluation form for the workshop. Um, uh, so please do take the time to fill out the evaluation form. Um, we will be sending out a recording of the session, including the links that were discussed in the presentations today um, and uh, some other extra information for you. Uh, so bear with us. We have to sort of render the video before we can send it out. So it won't come immediately after. We're not that fancy, um, but it will come this afternoon to you probably early this afternoon. Um, and again, if you do have any questions, maybe uh, Marianne and Ulrike, do you want to put email addresses maybe um, or whatever address people should use to contact the museum or for more information, particularly if they want to be using this in their classroom, you know, and they want a little bit of support with something or have questions, we can pop those in Perhaps. the window there. Yeah. Salima, do you want to put the education email that is probably the best to compile everything? Perfect. Then Salima can send it either to me or to Ulrika or to whoever thinks is best best place to be able to respond. Okay, perfect. Well, that is really great. I really appreciate the time that everybody has taken today. I, I know it's busy for all of the teachers at home. You're also juggling your sessions with the students and your family responsibilities. Uh, so I just wanna say a big thank you to everybody for taking the time to be here live. Uh, and a special thanks to the museum uh, for Ulrike and for Marianne for taking the time to do the session with us today. Um, I know I really appreciated it. Uh, and I hope that we can do more of these sessions to come. I hope that this virtual, these virtual sessions just really open up opportunities for us. We will be thank more so than happy. Yeah, was, thank you was, so much. And, and we definitely will be more than happy to support further sessions. And we are here for any follow up, for any deep diving that might be needed for any conversations, because we are all in this together. Great. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Marianne. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Salima, for your help in the back end there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank Bye you. Everybody. Thank you. Enjoy the afternoon. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.